So this is chapter 13 in which we're going to talk about the spinal cord, spinal nerves, and spinal reflexes. So all about the spine. So we'll start with spinal cord anatomy. So we'll introduce you to some terminology and talk briefly about some regional differences in different areas of the spinal cord. So to start with, the spinal cord does not run the entire length of the spinal column. In fact, the spinal cord actually ends between the L1 and L2 vertebrae. So remember lumbar 1 and lumbar 2. So that's actually where you have the end of the spinal cord. So farther down below that, we have descending uh, what we call roots. And we'll talk about what those roots are in a moment. But the spinal cord itself actually ends between L1 and L2. So if we look at a cross section of the spinal cord as shown over here on the right side, the posterior part of the spinal cord has a very small groove called the posterior median sulcus. So this is going to be on the posterior or dorsal side. And then on the anterior side, we have a much deeper groove called the anterior median fissure. So if you're looking at the cross section of a piece of spinal cord, you can orient yourself as to which side is the posterior side and which side is the anterior side by looking for this very deep fissure and knowing that that is going to be the anterior side. And keep in mind uh, that fissures are deeper and more pronounced than sulci. So this can help you remember that the posterior median sulcus is not going to be as deep as the anterior median fissure. So when we look at the cross section of the spinal cord, we can see uh, white matter on the outsides and gray matter on the inside. A lot of times the gray matter is described as being shaped like a butterfly or the letter H. You can see that it changes appearance slightly as we move down the spinal cord. But in all cases, the gray matter is going to be in sort of this roughly H-shaped or butterfly-shaped um, feature on the inside. Now, as you move down the spinal cord and you take different cross sections, if you look at the cross section through the cervical area up here versus the thoracic area here versus the lumbar area here versus the sacral area down here, you'll see that there are two, a couple of areas that have an enlargement of the gray matter. And we call this the cervical enlargement of the gray matter and the lumbar um, enlargement of the gray matter. And the reason why we have these regions of enlargement is because um, these are the areas where you have more neurons dedicated to motor and sensory input for the upper and lower arms. So the cervical enlargement has additional gray matter for the neurons that are going to go out uh, to the arms. And the uh, lumbosacral enlargement has additional neurons that are going to go out to the legs. So that's the reasons why these areas have more gray matter. So the spinal cord is divided into 31 segments. And these roughly correlate with the vertebrae that you learned about in Chapter 7. Although, again, keep in mind that the end of the spinal cord is going to be um, higher than the end of the vertebral column. Spinal cord ends between L1 and L2. So, for example, the sacral section of the spinal cord is actually way up here between T12 and like uh, L1. It's this uh, pink area of the spinal cord. But the spinal cord is divided into five regions. So we have the cervical region, which has eight cervical spinal nerves that are designated C1 to C8. So one additional nerve than there are cervical vertebrae. Then the orange region is the, the thoracic spinal nerve region. And you have 12 thoracic spinal nerves, T1 to T12. The green area will be the lumbar spinal region, where you have the lumbar spinal nerves L1 to L5. This little uh, magenta colored section will be the sacral spinal region, and you have five sacral spinal nerves S1 to S5. And then you can't really see it here, but there is uh, one coccygeal nerve that's going to come out and go all the way down here at the bottom. So each segment of the spinal cord, so those 31 segments that we just mentioned, has a pair 
of what is called dorsal root ganglia that come off the posterior side. And again, remember, you can tell the posterior side because it has the posterior median sulcus. And so we're on the posterior side. We've got this posterior or dorsal root that comes off, and then we'll talk about that in a second. And then we have this swollen region called the dorsal root ganglion. It's also sometimes just referred to as a spinal ganglion. And if you remember from earlier lectures, I mentioned to you that the word ganglion is in reference to the only time that you find neuron cell bodies outside of the CNS. So the CNS te uh, technically ends with the spinal cord. So when we're over here, we're technically now out of the CNS. And so this is a ganglion. And in fact, the dorsal root ganglion contains the cell bodies of sensory neurons. So these are those unipolar neurons that we looked at in chapter 12. So they have the cell body and then they have one extension that goes in both directions. So the cell body is located in the dorsal root ganglion and then the axons are going to um, actually extend into the dorsal root and then the dendrites will be way out in the periphery of the body. And so the axons of these sensory, uh, sensory neurons actually will form the dorsal root, which is also called the posterior root. Then on the other side where you have the deep anterior median fissure, so this is the anterior side, here is where you have the ventral roots, also called the anterior roots, and these contain the axons of motor neurons. So the cell bodies of the motor neurons are actually in the gray matter in the spinal cord itself, um, unlike the cell bodies of sensory neurons, which are in the ganglia. So the cell bodies of the motor neurons are in the gray matter of the spinal cord, and then the ventral root is their axons coming out. And then where the dorsal root and the ventral root come together, that is where we get our spinal nerve. And as mentioned on the previous uh, slide, there are 31 pairs of uh, spinal nerves. So for example, you have eight pairs of cranial nerves. So uh, cranial nerve one, you have one on each side. And again, when we talk about the spinal nerves, we're talking about after the dorsal root and ventral root have come together and joined up. And this would be what we would consider to be a mixed nerve because it has both sensory and motor information. So the dorsal root is sensory only, the ventral root is motor only, and then when they come together, we have a mixed nerve called the spinal nerve. So some more terminology to be familiar with. So at the base of the spinal cord, which is again between L1 and L2 of the uh, lumbar vertebrae, we have the tapered conical end of the spinal cord and the name of this end of the spinal cord is called the conus medullaris. So that's just the Latin term that they assigned for the tapered end. Then another term to know is phylum terminale. This is a strand of fibrous tissue. It actually starts at the very tip of the conus medullaris and it runs all the way down and it becomes part of the coccygeal ligament. So this is actually part of what anchors the spinal cord uh, within the spinal column as we'll see in a few minutes. And then the cauda equina, which is Latin for horse tail. So equina is Latin for horse, cauda is Latin for tail. Remember caudal from chapter one. So cauda equina is horse tail. And this is going to be all of those long dorsal and ventral roots of spinal segments L2 to L5. I mean L2 to S5. So remember in the previous slide that I explained to you that you have the dorsal roots that come out of each segment of the spinal cord that carry sensory information and you have the ventral roots that come out of each segment that carry the motor information. And because the spinal cord ends between L1 and L2, the nerves that come out between the vertebrae, between L2 and all the way down to the coccyx, those nerves have to have really long roots. So the roots actually come off of the spinal cord and then travel all the way down to the point where they go out between the vertebrae and the intervertebral foramen. And so early anatomists, when they looked at this structure, it looked like a horse's tail because it looked like a bunch of strands held together. And that's why they gave it, gave it the name cauda equina.
And so this slide might help you see it better. So in this slide, we're actually looking at a real spinal cord. So you can see what I mean when I talk about what looks like a horse's tail. So here is the tip of the conus medullaris. So this would be the actual bottom of the spinal cord that ends between L1 and L2. You can see the long phylum terminale that eventually becomes part of the coccygeal ligament and helps to anchor the bottom of the spinal cord. And then now you can see why the cauda equina is called the cauda equina, how it actually does look like a tail with all of these different strands. These are all of the long dorsal and ventral roots that came off higher up on the spinal cord and have to go all the way down to the uh, correct vertebrae where they ex exit through the intervertebral foramen. In this section, we're going to talk about the spinal meninges, including the meningeal layers, the anchoring ligaments, and meningitis. So the meninges are the membranes that cover both the brain and the spinal cord. And the cranial meninges and the spinal meninges are actually continuous with each other. And both the brain and the spinal cord have the same three layers, although there are some slight differences. So for example, the dura mater in the cranial meninges has two layers, whereas in the spinal cord it doesn't. And the spinal cord has an epidural space, which is not present in the cranial meninges. So the outermost layer is called the dura mater, and this is the tough outermost layer. Dura mater means tough mother in Latin. So unlike the cranial meninges, the spinal meninges have an epidural space. So this is the space between the dura mater and the vertebrae. So actually there's a small uh, epidural space on both sides. And the epidural space is full of areolar tissue, blood vessels, and adipose tissue. So in this particular image from your textbook, you can really see the adipose tissue in both of the epidural spaces. The epidural space is where you frequently get uh, injections of anesthetics or other treatments. So epidural anesthesia, like what they use during labor and delivery, involves injecting drugs into the epidural space. And the reason for injecting into the epidural space, so we're not actually going into the meninges, so this stays on the outside of the meninges. And the advantage to that is that it doesn't actually get into the CSF, because we're, we're staying outside of the meninges, and it's only going to affect the spinal nerves that are close to the site of injection. So it results in a more localized anesthetic. The middle layer is called the arachnoid mater, and it gets its name, arachnoid means spider, because this is a very um, web-like layer. If you look at it, it looks uh, very webby, like a spider web, spider web. so it's a delicate uh, network of fibers. And underneath the arachnoid mater, you have the arachnoid, the subarachnoid space, which is shown right here. So this uh, image from your textbook actually makes it look like there's a space between the dura mater and arachnoid mater, but normally there's not a space there. Those two are connected. They're just showing it like this so you can see the two layers. And then between the arachnoid mater and the actual outside of the spinal cord is where you'd have your subarachnoid space. And this is where uh, cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, circulates. And this is the same uh, CSF that circulates around the brain and within the brain. So all of the CSF in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord is the same and it's constantly circulating throughout the brain and spinal cord in the subarachnoid space. So a lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap, is when uh, a doctor or physician needs to sample some CSF and so they actually go into the subarachnoid space with a needle. So unlike an epidural injection, in this case, we're actually going to puncture through the dura mater. We're going to puncture through the arachnoid mater, and the needle is going to go into the subarachnoid space. And this is usually done in the cauda equina region of the spinal cord, so somewhere below L1 to L2. And the reason for that is you have uh, less chance of, of damage with your needle in this area um, because now you've actually punctured the protective membrane of the spinal cord. And if you go up too high, you have the chance of the needle going into the spinal cord and causing damage. 
Down here in the Cauda Equina region, we only have those long dorsal and ventral roots. And while there can be um, some danger of damaging those roots, uh, that is preferable over actual damage to the spinal cord. So lumbar punctures are usually done down in the caudal, cauda equina region. And again, a lumbar puncture allows for a collection of a CSF sample. Um, this allows for the di uh, diagnosis of multiple different types of diseases and disorders, not only of the spinal cord, but of the brain as well, because as I mentioned, the CSF you find down here is the same CSF that's inside the brain. So if you have a particular uh, brain issue, they will do a lumbar puncture to look at the uh, CSF. And then also, if there's a medication that has to be administered and it does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it can't be given orally or, or uh, by a regular injection, they will have to actually inject it straight into the CSF using a lumbar puncture. And then the innermost layer is called the pia mater. This is the innermost delicate layer, and this layer is firmly bound to the underlying tissue, which in the case of the spinal cord means it's firmly bound to the spinal cord itself, and it's held in place uh, by astrocytes, which was a type of neuroglia found in the CNS. So because the spinal cord has space between the dura mater and the bones, so again, in the cranial meninges, you don't have that space, but we do have it in the spinal cord. So the spinal cord, the meninges are not directly tied to the periosteum of the vertebrae. So the spinal cord needs to be a little bit more anchored to prevent excessive movement um, within that canal. And so there are two types of uh, ligaments. First, we have denticulate ligaments, and these are these little ligaments here. They extend through the pia mater, the arachnoid mater, and the dura mater, um, and they attach to uh, nearby um, connective tissue, and this prevents lateral side-to-side -side movement of the spinal cord within the canal. So these here would be the roots or the spinal nerve that comes together from the dorsal root and the ventral root come together to make the uh, spinal nerve. So the denticular ligaments are these little connection points in between. And then you have the coccygeal ligament at the bottom. And then you also have direct connections between the uh, spinal cord and the foramen magnum at the base of the occipital bone. And these two connections, one at the bottom and one at the top, prevent superior inferior movement of the spinal cord within the canal. So these are two extra ways to anchor and protect the spinal cord. So meningitis is inflammation of the meningeal membranes and it's usually caused by a bacterial or a viral infection. There are rare cases where it can be caused by a fungus or a parasite, but usually it is a bacterial or viral. It can start in either the spinal meninges or the cranial meninges, but no matter where it starts, it usually ends up involving all of the meninges, both in the uh, spine and the cranium, uh, because the entire meningeal system is all interconnected. So as I mentioned before, the spinal uh, meninges just flow right into the cranial meninges, so there's no real separation between the two. Meningitis is a very dangerous condition. Uh, it can disrupt the flow of CSF and lead to a condition called hydrocephalus. It can also damage and kill neurons and neuroglia by, um, again, disrupting the flow of CSF and changing the composition of CSF. And CSF is like the um, actual uh, blood supply or circulatory system for the brain and spinal cord. So disrupting its contents can uh, cause all sorts of problems with the neurons. It can also lead to swelling of the brain from inflammation, and it can eventually lead to sepsis, which is when the infection actually gets into the bloodstream because there's a close connection between uh, the meninges and the bloodstream, especially at the places called choroid plexus, where CSF is produced. And once you get the sepsis, then it gets even more dangerous because that can cause all of your organs to start shutting down. So meningitis, very dangerous. Uh, there are vaccines to prevent bacterial meningitis, which is the most dangerous type. In this section, we'll look at the organization of the white and the gray matter in the spinal cord.
So we'll start with the gray matter organization. And as a reminder, remember gray matter contains neuronal cell bodies and unmyelinated axons. So the gray matter in the spinal cord, in the cross section, as I mentioned before, forms an H or a butterfly shape in the middle of the spinal cord. There are um, posterior, lateral, and anterior horns, and so these are the little projections of gray matter. So like the top portion of the H would be the posterior or dorsal horn. Notice that this is going to be on the same side as the posterior median sulcus, which was the side with the shallow groove. A lateral horn will be the bit that's sticking off on either side, and then the anterior or ventral horn will be on the same side as the anterior median fissure, and so this will be the bottom of the H or butterfly wing. We also have gray commissures, and these are areas where you have unmyelinated axons crossing from one side to the other. And so there are two gray commissures. There is one above the central canal called the posterior gray commissure. Again, it's on the same side as the posterior sulcus. And then on the other side, we have the anterior gray commissure, which is on the same side as the anterior median fissure. So that's above and below the central canal. And just as a reminder, the central canal is the hole in the very center of the spinal cord, and this is a passageway for the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. So nuclei is the term that we use in the central nervous system to describe a grouping of gray matter containing neuronal cell bodies. And so this doesn't refer to like a nucleus of a cell. Instead, this refers to an area of cell bodies that all have a uh, similar function, so they're working together. And so in the spinal cord, in the gray matter, we've got a collection of sensory nuclei, and these are going to be found in the dorsal or posterior horns. And the sensory nuclei are receiving information from the periphery. So information is coming through the uh, dorsal root or the posterior root. Remember, the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion, also called the spinal ganglion. And so the axons from the sensory neurons are coming in through the posterior root, and they'll form synapses on neurons in the sensory nuclei. And so the somatic sensory nuclei are, is going to be uh, more in the posterior horn, whereas the visceral sensory nuclei will be closer to the lateral horn. And then you also have motor nuclei, and these are found in the ventral or anterior horns, and these are the locations of the cell bodies of neurons that are going to send signals out to the peripheral effectors, like for example to skeletal muscles. And so again, the visceral ones are more in the middle, and the somatic ones are more uh, out to the edge. And so these, this is where you'll have the cell bodies of the multipolar motor neurons, and their axons will leave and form the anterior or ventral roots. And so in general, you can say that the posterior or dorsal side of the spinal cord is devoted to sensory information, while the anterior or ventral side of the spinal cord is devoted to motor commands. And the organization um, keeps going down at every level that you look at. So even if you were to look, for example, in the somatic sensory nuclei, you would see specific areas devoted to like the hands versus the feet versus the legs. And even in the somatic motor nuclei where you have commands, even your flexors and your extensors uh, originate from different areas. And so it's so specific and organized that uh, doctors can tell what kind of damage to expect from a specific injury to the spinal cord. So let's take a look at the white matter organization. And again, remember that white matter is dominated by myelinated axons. So white matter usually represents pathways of where axons are traveling from one location to another. So whereas the neuronal cell bodies in the gray matter are grouped into nuclei, white matter is grouped into columns. And so these columns contain tracts of axons that are sharing structural and functional characteristics. 
So in other words, these axons, they're all similar to each other in terms of uh, size and myelination and how fast they can propagate an action potential. And they also uh, typically have a, um, the same starting area and the same destination. So the columns of the spinal cord are organized into a posterior white column. It's on the same side again as the posterior median sulcus. You have a lateral white column, which is the uh, white area on the two sides. And then you have an anterior white column. And the anterior white column is going to be on the same side as the anterior median fissure. So in all of these columns, you have ascending tracts, which are carrying sensory information up to the brain. So they are going upwards. They're part of the ascending um, or sensory part of the nervous system. And as a reminder, a tract, when we use the word tract, we're talking about a bundle of axons that are somewhat similar in diameter, myelination, and propagation speed, and they typically have the same origination point and the same destination. And then you also have descending tracts that carry motor commands from the brain down to the body. So the descending tracts are carrying information downward, ascending tracts are carrying information towards the brain. And then just like we had a gray commissure, we have a single white commissure on the anterior side. So this anterior white commissure is connecting the anterior white column on one side to the anterior white column on the other side. We don't have a commissure on the posterior side because the two posterior white columns sit right up against each other. In this section, we're going to talk about spinal nerves, their anatomy, dermatomes, shingles, and what makes up a nerve plexus. So as we mentioned before, there are 31 spinal nerve pairs and they are classified according to region, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. And these are mixed nerves that are formed uh, of the joining of the ventral and dorsal roots. That's why we call them mixed, because they have both sensory and motor fibers within them. The spinal nerves are surrounded by three layers of connective tissue. And this should sound very similar to what you learned in the muscle chapter. So outside of the entire spinal nerve, we have an epineurium. So that's the outermost layer covering the entire spinal nerve. Then on the inside, we have a perineurium, which is separating the giant nerve into a bunch of bundles, which are called fascicles. And within each fascicle, we've got individual axons. And the perineurium also is going to contain arteries and veins. So this is where the blood vessels are located. And then if we look inside a fascicle at the individual nerve axons, we can see that each individual axon is surrounded by an endoneurium. So the endoneurium would be even surrounding outside. Like even if it's myelinated, it's still going to have an endoneurium on the outside. Also notice because we're talking about peripheral nerves now, myelination is um, done by the Schwann cells. And the endoneurium contains the capillaries that are going to deliver the nutrients needed to the individual um, myelinated or unmyelinated axons. So as the spinal nerves move further out into the periphery, they are going to branch into smaller and smaller uh, fiber branches, and these are what we call our peripheral nerves. So your textbook has a whole spotlight figure that goes into all of the details about how spinal nerves branch. I'm not going to go into the level of detail that is in your textbook, but I do want to point out a couple of things on this figure um, for you to pay attention to. So first, notice that the unipolar sensory neurons have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion, also called the spinal ganglion. And so these are the little cell bodies. They're unipolar because they have that one extension that comes off of them. Also notice how the sensory information is going to travel to the posterior dorsal side of the spinal cord. So we're traveling down the uh, dorsal root to the dorsal or posterior horns. 
Notice that there are different pathways for visceral versus somatic information. So the somatic information is shown by the red uh, neurons, and it's going to go to the somatic sensory nuclei in the spinal cord. And then the visceral information coming from your organs is traveling along the purple neurons and will go to the visceral sensory nuclei in the spinal cord. Also notice that the swelling area we see here represents a sympathetic ganglion, which is what we're gonna cover in chapter 16 when we get to the autonomic nervous system. And then here's the other side of the figure that looks at the motor commands. So this is motor information going from the brain and then out to peripheral effectors. Here, notice that the motor neuron cell bodies are in the ventral anterior side of the spinal cord. So in the case of the motor information, the cell bodies are in the spinal cord. Note that there are different pathways for visceral and somatic commands again. You've got the somatic motor commands that originate here in the um, anterior most gray horn, and they travel out through the red neuron. And then the uh, visceral motor commands that are going to your organs will start in this blue nucleus and travel out through the blue neurons. Also notice that this view gives you a look at a sympathetic neuron, which is shown in black and it has its cell body here in the sympathetic ganglion. Remember, a ganglion is an area where you have cell bodies outside of the CNS, neuronal cell bodies outside of the CNS. And again, we're gonna talk about more about the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems in chapter 16. And then if you're curious, I'm not gonna go into the level of detail that the textbook does, but everywhere you see it talking about uh, Ramus communicans, these are nerve branches, and these always uh, involve, or usually always involve, autonomic pathways, which again, we're gonna talk about in chapter 16. And so if you see the textbook talking about a gray ramus, it's talking about uh, an unmyelinated axon, and if it's a white ramus, it's talking about myelinated axons. So some more terminology, a dermatome is a region of skin that is monitored by a single pair of spinal nerves. So if I take a look um, at this figure here, notice the left side is showing the anterior side and the right side is showing the posterior side so that you can see because some of these dermatomes wrap around the body. So for example, uh, T10, which is innervated by thoracic nerve 10, comes around to the front of your uh, stomach, close to where your belly button is, but it also wraps a little piece around on your back as well. And so the dermatomes can aid with diagnosing problems. So for example, if you constantly have your uh, index finger going numb, right, that can tell a physician that you may have a problem with your C7 nerve versus if it's your little finger that keeps going numb, that may be a problem with your T1 nerve. So the dermatomes, even though they actually are showing regions of skin innervated by each of these spinal nerves, they can also help with other motor and sensory problems because these nerves tend to correspond to these same regions when you're looking at uh, muscles and other sensory input. Uh, the term neuropathy refers to the regional loss of sensory and or motor function, most often resulting from nerve trauma or compression. So for example, if you had a compressed C7 nerve in your um, spinal column, then that could cause um, numbness and tingling in the areas that you see here highlighted by the C7. There are lots of different symptoms of peripheral neuropathy because it's gonna depend on which peripheral nerve is affected. It's also gonna depend on whether it's damage to a sensory nerve, damage to a motor nerve, or damage to an autonomic nerve. And so uh, neuropathy can have quite a wide range um, of symptoms depending on the nerve affected. Shingles is a term we use for the reactivation of a latent virus. This is the varicella zoster virus. It's the same virus that causes chicken pox. So if you've ever had chicken pox as a kid, um, the virus will actually 
pick a couple of your dorsal root ganglion and your spinal cord to hang out and it basically goes into a dormant state and then at some point later in your life you have a weakened immune system that virus can reactivate and when it reactivates it causes shingles so it lies dormant in the dorsal root ganglia it can reawaken with a weakened immune system and because it lies in the dorsal root ganglia typically it's only lying dormant in one or two dorsal root ganglia and so um, the specific dorsal root ganglia where it's lying dormant will determine where you actually end up having your rash and blisters so the rash, rash and blisters will correspond to the dermatome of the affected nerve so I see these blisters coming around the side to the belly button here in this picture that's telling me that the uh, virus is probably in the dorsal root ganglia of let's see either T9 or T10 Right, so the, the virus actually travels along that spinal nerve, so that's why the blisters will show up in the region that the spinal nerve actually covers according to its dermatome. So here's a picture just to show um, a weakened immune system will reawaken this virus. The virus itself travels along nerves, and that's why the uh, rash and the blisters will be along the nerve's pathway. There is a shingles vaccine that is recommended for older adults because as you age, your immune system gets weaker and weaker. So if you do have the latent virus, it has more of a chance of reemerging as you age. A nerve plexus is a branching network of intersecting nerves. So uh, multiple spinal nerves, they came off of the spinal column as a single nerve, but then they connect up and branch and join with other spinal nerves to form these um, plexuses. So these are formed mainly from the anterior rami of the spinal nerves, and there are four major plexuses. So there is a cervical plexus that's up here in the cervical region. There's a brachial plexus in the upper arm. There's a lumbar plexus in the lower back and then there is a sacral plexus even farther down. I'm not going to go into the detail uh, that your textbook does with each of these uh, plexuses but I did want to show you just how um, complicated it can get. This is an example of the brachial plexus here. So you can see there's quite a lot of uh, crosstalk and communication between the different spinal nerves. In this case, C5 to T1 um, get very interconnected with each other. And again, that's all I'm going to go over in terms of the nerve plexus. In this section, we're going to introduce you to reflexes and go over the basics of a reflex arc. So a reflex is a rapid, automatic response to a specific stimuli. Do you remember the basic components of homeostatic regulation that we covered in Chapter 1? Hopefully you do. If you remember, we picked up information using a receptor, it took that information to a control center, and then commands were given out to an effector to do something about it. Well, reflexes work in a very similar manner. So in this chapter, we're going to focus on neural reflexes, and in a neural reflex, sensory fibers deliver information from peripheral sensory receptors. The information is integrated in the CNS, which is the control center, and then motor fibers carry commands out to peripheral effectors, for example, skeletal muscles, and these are going to counteract whatever the initial stimulus was. So let's look at the steps of a basic reflex arc. And so the arc, what we call a reflex arc, begins at the receptor and ends at the peripheral effector. So we're going to look at the example withdrawal reflex, which involves five steps. So this will help you learn the basics of a reflex arc. So we start with number one, the arrival of the stimulus and the activation of a peripheral sensory receptor. In this case, it would be a touch receptor and probably some pain receptors as well. Step two, we activate a sensory neuron. So the receptors are going to uh, generate an action potential 
is going to travel down a sensory neuron. Again, notice the sensory neuron has its cell body in the dorsal root ganglion, and the axon is traveling through the dorsal root into the spinal cord. Step three, information processing in the CNS. And so this is gonna take place either in the spinal cord or the brain. In very simple reflexes, like this reflex arc we're looking at here, the processing actually takes place at the level of the spinal cord, but then the brain also gets a copy of the message so it knows what's going on. And so the basic uh, take home point here is that information processing is done by inner neurons in the CNS, and these can be excitatory or inhibitory. In this case, this is an excitatory interneuron. And so when the sensory neuron sends a signal, it's gonna cause an action potential in the excitatory inner neuron. And because it's excitatory, this neuron is going to excite or cause an action potential in a motor neuron. So that's step number four, the activation of a motor neuron, which is going to send its axon out through the uh, ventral root and out into the periphery. And then number five would be response by the effector, which in this case is a skeletal muscle that causes you to jerk your hand away from the stimulus. So a reflex usually involves negative feedback in which you are acting to remove or oppose the original stimulus. So for example, if you have a painful stimulus like touching a sharp tack or touching a hot stove, you're going to act to stop touching that painful stimulus. In this section, we're gonna look at the different ways that we can classify reflexes. So there are four major ways to classify reflexes, and we're gonna start with development as shown in blue. So reflexes can either be innate reflexes, which are reflexes that you're born with. Examples are the withdrawal reflex we just looked at, as well as sucking, so an infant being able to suck at its mother's breast, and blinking when your eyelashes are touched. You can also have acquired reflexes, and these are learned motor patterns. For example, after you've been driving a while, you might slam on the brakes of your car if something runs out in front of you without even thinking about it, or riding a bike, the little uh, reflexive uh, movements you make to stay balanced. Uh, sport, different types of sports, playing musical instruments, all of these involve learned or acquired reflexes. The second way that we can uh, classify reflexes is based on the motor or effector response, and this is shown in green. We have somatic reflexes in which the effectors are going to be skeletal muscles. Uh, examples here are the withdrawal reflex and the stretch reflex, which is also known as the knee-jerk reaction or the patellar reflex. Notice that one type of reflex can be classified in multiple ways. We already mentioned the withdrawal reflex as being an innate reflex. It can also be considered a somatic reflex. So a single reflex could be classified in each of these different ways. So contrasted with the somatic reflexes are the visceral or autonomic reflexes. In these cases, the effectors are smooth muscle or cardiac muscle or glands. An example here would be the elevated heart rate and the release of epinephrine from the adrenal gland when you get scared. The third way to categorize reflexes is the complexity of the circuit. So we have monosynaptic reflexes, which only involve one synapse. And we're gonna look at a sample one of these in a moment. The example is the stretch reflex, also known as the knee jerk reflex or the patellar reflex. Remember that um, we talked about synaptic delay in chapter 12, and that's the delay that it takes for the action potential to cause release of neurotransmitter and then the neurotransmitter to call, cross the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So the more synapses that you have that information has to cross, the longer it takes. So the most quick reflexes, the fastest reflexes, are going to have the fewest number of synapses. And longer, more complex uh, reflexes will have to cross more synapses, but they will also be slower. 
So in contrast to a monosynaptic reflex, we have polysynaptic reflexes, which can involve anywhere from two synapses up to hundreds of synapses. An example here is the withdrawal reflex, and if you go back and look at that reflex arc, you'll notice that the withdrawal reflex had two different synapses. And the final way that we can classify reflexes is by processing site. So spinal reflexes, the processing occurs in the spinal cord. There still may be some uh, copies of the information sent up to the brain, but the actual inner neurons that are controlling the effectors are in the spinal cord. Examples are the withdrawal reflex that we just looked at, as well as the stretch reflex. And then you have cranial reflexes in which the processing occurs in the brain. And so cranial reflexes a lot of the times uh, take place or involve the cranial nerves that are covered in chapter 14. And an example of this is the pupillary reflex, which is the constriction and dilation of the pupils in the eye in response to light. And that particular reflex is carried on the uh, oculomotor nerve, the motor part of the information. The sensory part comes in on the optic nerve. In this section, we're going to look at some example reflexes. So an example monosynaptic reflex called the stretch reflex. We'll also talk about how the, the role the stretch reflex plays in postural reflexes, and then look at two examples of polysynaptic reflexes. So first we'll take a look at an example monosynaptic reflex. So again, monosynaptic means only one synapse is involved. And since information only has to cross one synapse, this is actually the fastest reflex there is. So our example monosynaptic reflex is also called the stretch reflex. And so when a muscle is stretched, this reflex causes that muscle to contract to prevent overstretching. So this helps to automatically regulate skeletal muscle length. So if you remember from chapter 10, if a muscle is too stretched, then you don't have any zone of overlap between the thick and thin filaments. So the stretch reflex helps to prevent that overstretching and also to prevent damage that it could occur from overstretching. One of the best known examples is the patellar reflex, also known as the knee jerk reflex. So when you hit the patellar tendon, which comes down from the patella and runs to the tibia, this causes your leg to jerk. And that's because hitting on the patellar tendon causes the stretch of your quadriceps, which then is, causes this um, stretch reflex, and the quadricep will then uh, contract, and that causes the knee jerk reaction. Stretch reflexes also play a major role in postural control, as we'll see on the next slide. So with the stretch reflex, it's a monosynaptic reflex, and that's because there is a direct connection between the sensory and the motor neuron. So there are no inner neurons in this type of reflex. So what happens with the stress, stretch reflex is that inside your muscles, there are special sensory receptors called muscle spindles, and that's shown here buried inside the muscle fibers. So these muscle spindles are actually sensory organs. And so the muscle spindle can, uh, will start firing action potentials when it senses that the muscle is being stretched. So that sensory neuron is going to take the information to the spinal cord, and then it's going to directly synapse onto a motor neuron that causes the same muscle to contract. So notice that the sensory receptor is buried in between muscle fibers, and then those same muscle fibers are going to get a signal from a motor neuron to contract. So it's the fastest and simplest reflex. The sensory neuron directly communicates with the motor neuron, so a muscle is stretched and you get immediate contraction of that muscle. So postural reflexes are the reflexes that help us maintain our normal upright posture. And these involve both stretch reflexes, as we just discussed, as well as more complex polysynaptic reflexes. So I'm going to give you an example of how stretch reflexes can work to maintain our posture when we're standing. So if you accidentally start leaning too far forward, this is going to activate stretch receptors in your calf muscles like the gastrocnemius. 
And so as, as you would lean forward, this muscle would stretch. That's going to activate those muscle spindles and they're going to send signals directly to this muscle to contract, which will bring you back to your upright posture. Not shown, but it works the same way. If you lean too far back, this would stretch muscles in your shins and thighs and you would have the same response. So this way, no matter which way you lean, the stretch receptors will work to maintain and return you to the upright posture. So postural muscles generally maintain a firm muscle tone, meaning that they maintain a level of contractedness even at rest, and they have extremely sensitive stretch receptors so as to maintain your posture. So now let's look at an example of a polysynaptic reflex, so a reflex with more than one synapse, and we're gonna look at what's called a withdrawal reflex, and a sample one of this is called a flexor reflex. So let's take a look at this. So this occurs like when you uh, touch a painful stimulus, so like a hot oven or something sharp, that pain stimulus is going to be transmitted to the spinal cord through a sensory neuron shown in red. The sensory neuron is then going to send that information to an excitatory interneuron, which is shown in white. The excitatory interneuron is going to do a couple of things. It's going to activate a motor neuron, shown in black, that is going to stimulate your flexor to contract. So this is going to contract the flexors of the arm and make you pull your hand away from the painful stimulus. At the same time, the excitatory inner neuron is sending a message up to the brain to let the brain know what happened. This is how um, you realize you touched something hot, but your the thought actually reaches your head and you're thinking about it after you've already pulled your head away, your hand away. And that's because the pulling the hand away is very quick and it takes a little while for that signal to go up to the brain. Then the excitatory inner neuron shown in white is also talking to an inhibitory inner neuron shown in black, dotted black. And this inhibitory inner neuron is, again, sending a message to the brain, but also it is inhibiting a motor neuron that would normally control your extensor, which is the opposing muscle, the antagonistic muscle. And so if you're going to uh, stimulate a muscle on one side, you want to inhibit the opposing muscle so that it's not going to interfere with the movement. So the, um, we have the sensory neuron, we have two types of inner neurons, and then we are exciting or sending a stimulus down one motor neuron and inhibiting or blocking a stimulus down the other motor neuron. So there are multiple synapses involved. So we've got a synapse here, 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 and here, and synapses in the brain. And we have both excitatory and inhibitory processes that are going on. And this idea of uh, in inhibiting the opposing muscle group is called reciprocal inhibition. So the antagonistic muscles are inhibited. And this counteracts the antagonistic muscles normal stretch response. So when you flex your arm, this will stretch the extensors and you don't want the stretch reflex of the extensors to kick in and cause them to contract too, which is why we have this extra little circuit that's going to make sure those extensors stay inhibited. Notice that this type of reflex is what we call ipsilateral, meaning everything happened on the same side of the body. So the information never crosses from one side of the spinal cord to the other, it stays on the same side, and that is called ipsilateral. All right, so here I'm highlighting the flexor reflex that we just looked at. So we have a painful stimulus. Uh, in this case, we're stepping on a tack. The information is traveling down the sensory neuron to the spinal cord where it's going to interact with an excitatory inner neuron. This excitatory inner, inner neuron sends a signal to the brain. It also is going to excite the motor neuron that uh, causes your leg to flex, which allows you to pull away from the painful stimulus. So this is all the flexor reflex we just looked at. We also have the excitatory inner neuron talking to an inhibitory inner neuron, which is going to inhibit the extensors.
and then also send a signal up to the brain. So now let's look at the second example of a polysynaptic reflex. And the second example works in conjunction with the flexor reflex, and it's called the crossed extensor reflex. So at the same time we have this flexor reflex going on, we also have this excitatory interneuron is exciting extensors on the other side, so the opposite side, and the inhibitory interneuron is inhibiting flexors on the other side. So that means that while you are flexing one leg, your other leg is being told to extend. Because imagine, if you were to flex both your legs at the same time and you're standing up, you're going to fall over. So if you flex one leg in order to maintain your balance, the other leg needs to stay extended. So the crossed extensor reflex makes sure that on the other side, the opposite side to the flexor reflex, you have the extensor is stimulated and the flexor is inhibited. So we basically took those same two interneurons from the flexor reflex and they cross sides to talk to motor neurons on the other side. So again, we have multiple synapses, we have both excitatory and inhibitory processes, and in this case it's called a contralateral reflex arc because it's involving the other side of the body. And again, the crossed extensor reflex complements the flexor reflex, so like in the case of the legs, these two are going to occur simultaneously to make sure you maintain your balance and don't fall over. And as far as terminology goes, know that contralateral refers to the opposite side of the body. So polysynaptic reflexes have the following characteristics. They are always going to involve groups of interneurons. These interneurons are processing the information that comes in from the sensory neurons before sending out commands to motor neurons. These interneurons can be inhibitory or excitatory. The polysynaptic reflexes can involve more than one spinal segment. In the two examples that we looked at, we were only looking at one spinal segment, but they can also involve uh, segments above and below if they're going to be affecting multiple muscle groups. They can also involve reciprocal inhibition in which you inhibit the opposing muscle groups, and this can be on either the ipsilateral and the contralateral sides, depending on the specific reflex. They also can have what we call reverberating circuits, and this involves positive feedback that keeps the signal going within the inner neurons. So an excitatory inner neuron can keep another inner neuron excited, and this allows the information to continue to be processed even after the stimulus is gone. And several reflexes may work together to produce a response. So as we just saw, you can have the flexor reflex, which allows you to pull away from the a painful stimulus. And you also have like the crossed extensor reflex, which keeps you from falling over if uh, the limb that you happen to be pulling away is one of your legs. And in this last section, we'll talk about the influence of the brain on spinal cord reflexes, and we'll talk about the Babinski reflex. So processing centers in the brain can facilitate or inhibit spinal cord reflexes, except for monosynaptic reflexes like the stretch reflex, which are relatively inflexible, and that's because they have no inner neurons. Remember, in those reflexes, the sensory neuron talks directly to the motor neuron, and since there are no inner neurons, there's no place for the brain to sort of override that reflex. But in cases where the brain can override the reflex and polysynaptic reflexes, I'll give you a couple of examples. The first example is consciously not reacting to a painful stimulus. So if you prepare yourself ahead of time and you know you're going to touch something painful, you can uh, consciously override that reflex to pull back and keep your hand on the painful stimulus. And this is an example of the brain inhibiting the spinal reflex. Um, so, you know, people talk about mind over matter um, and doing things like being able to stand on nails or walk over hot coals.
Um, you have to be careful because the pain is usually a signal to your brain that there's some type of tissue damage. So like if you force yourself to hold your hand up against the hot stove, you're actually going to do tissue damage to yourself um, in the form of a burn. Um, but you can override uh, that spinal cord reaction. A second example um, is when you consciously activate motor neurons in another part of the body, and that can make all of your motor neurons more easily excitable, and this is called facilitation. And an example of this um, is in the case of reflex reinforcement. So you can enhance spinal reflexes by causing general facilitation. And a good example is the gendrastic maneuver, which if someone goes to the doctor and they have a very poor patella reflex or knee jerk reflex, um, the doctor can determine whether it's just, you know, something to do with nerves or the patient anticipating the hammer. Um, and they want to make sure that it's not actual, actually due to some type of nerve damage, they'll have the patient pull, put their hands together, link their fingers, and pull each hand against each other. So they're activating um, muscles and motor neurons that innervate the arm. And by doing that, it actually makes the leg muscles more prone to the reflex. And when you do the patella reflex, you'll get a larger jerk of the lower leg. So you can try this at home with your family or friends. Do the knee jerk, uh, do the little patellar test on their patellar tendon um, as normal, and then have them put their hands together and pull and do it again, and you should see a larger reaction. So this brings us to the Babinski reflex. So if you stroke the lateral stro uh, sole of the foot with like a flat, blunt object, in an adult, the toes should curl, and this is called the plantar reflex. But in an infant, the toes would fan out, and this is called a Babinski reflex. And so in infants, you'll get this fanning reaction where the toes spread apart all the way up until um, but somewhere between 12 and 24 months of age, and then it should turn to the toes curling, which is what is normal in adults. So what happens is that during development, uh, you have the descending motor pathways from the brain down to the spinal cord are developing. And so as the brain is getting more influence over the spinal cord, it reverses the response from the toes fanning out to the toes curling. So if you try to scrape a flat object up against the lateral sole of the foot and an, in an adult and you get the toes fanning, that is a signal to doctors that there are damage either in the higher centers of the brain, like in the motor cortex, or in the descending tracts of the motor neurons that are coming down from the brain. In other words, it does indicate that there is something pathological going on. So to reiterate, if you're testing an adult and you scrape something along the bottom of their foot and their toes fan out, in an adult, that's called a, called a positive Babinski sign, and it indicates damage to the brain motor centers or the descending tracts and the spinal cord. A lot of times you'll see this on the medical TV shows like Grey's Anatomy and the ER back in the day when they have a patient come into the uh, emergency room and they'll quickly run a sharp like, uh, or a blunt object like a pin up against their foot and they'll holler about whether it's a positive or negative Babinski result. So in an adult, a negative Babinski reflex is normal. A positive Babinski reflex in an adult is abnormal. And that is the end of chapter 13.